Good evening. Welcome everybody to night two of the revival. You can't hear? All right, let's get up and worship the Lord. Somebody get the lights, please.
with everything inside of me. I'll raise a hallelujah. Come on, let's sing it. Well, I will watch the darkness flee. In the past of me, barely breathing, when I'm not somebody, I believe in, hold on to me, when I miss the light, night is stolen, when I'm slamming all the doors you've opened, Hold on to me. Hold 
We're going to change this last song, but I'm going to switch batteries real quick. Sorry. Teamwork makes the dream work. Sing a new song to him that sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the lamb who was slain, and holy, holy is he. It's on heaven's mercy seat. You are my everything, and I will. 
I always want to apologize. I know it's, I'm being, being real raw right now, I guess, but I don't know if it was from my past. Um, Let us all tell them. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Good job, JD. I always want to apologize for, I don't know, the Lord works through us, works inside of us through music, and sometimes you want to get down, you know, and so, and that's how he, he uses us, so, it's a gift, when we're playing, sometimes you just lose your mind a little bit, and, <laughs> and, uh, and I always, I don't know if it's from my past or what, but I, I always want to come up and say, I'm sorry, y'all. I didn't mean to throw the guitar behind my head. And, <laughs> but Set it on I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm working on myself to quit apologizing for that stuff because that's what he gave us. And that's what he gave. Yeah. Woo, hallelujah. But so, so the, the, um, the traditions of man, where we came from in our past and just hearing people as you grow up say you can't be playing like that in church and you can't be talking like you know you can't get you can't you can't have that fire for God like that that's that's a load right there we need that Amen. we need we need we need somebody to catch that fire 
I remember when I first, when I first, um, I guess I first got the Holy Ghost. I don't, but I was just like, man, I, everybody I saw, you know, I wanted to tell them about Jesus. But after the world keeps beating you down, I'm like, you can't, you can't be talking like that to people and you lose it. But that's how we need to be. We need to learn how to catch that fire back as a veteran in Christ. You know what I mean? Brother, you got me pumped up. If I kick my keyboard over, mind your business. (laughs) I want to be close. I'm close to your side so heaven is real and death is a lie I want to hear voices of angels above and singing as one hallelujah come on let's sing holy holy Hallelujah. 
Amen. Y'all see? excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Well, welcome to King's Trail. If this is your first night here or you've been here from day one, we appreciate you. We're glad that you are here. You are here for a reason because the Lord has a word for you all tonight. Amen. Amen. I do want to introduce my brother tonight, Trey Johnson. Uh, we met his brother about three years ago at a conference down in San Antonio that we've gone to every year since we met him. Um, he's an anointed man of God. He is a world champion team roper. Um, we could go on and on. Uh, so, But I just want to introduce you to my brother Trey, and uh, y'all give him a big warm welcome. And he's going to bring the word tonight. How is everybody doing? Yes. This church likes to have fun, don't you? Uh, thank you, Lord. Do you want me just to keep talking and you'll fix me as I go? Okay. <laughs> hey, can we give all the helps team a hand clap for all their, their work and just their servant's heart and... Thank you for being in your ministry, being in your place. The worship team, y'all are a blessed people. You know that? Can we give them a hand clap? I am just so thankful. So thankful to be in the house of God and your pastors. Can y'all give them a hand clap? Ah, awesome, 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 awesome. Well, I take it that you are here to grow and learn tonight. Amen. I know that I am. Like Pastor said, uh, my name is Trey Johnson, and I'd love to say hi and shake each of your hand. And uh, but um, so maybe we'll get to do that tonight. If not, that uh, no big deal. Maybe we'll see you another time. And please help yourself to the product table at the back. Uh, Robert, uh, Robert, raise your hand so they'll know. Robert will be back there to help you with any of the teaching CDs or flash drives or a few of the books and stuff that I've written. Our Magazine and stuff is back there also where you can find uh, how to watch our TV shows and all the different networks and stuff we're on, RFD, Direct Dish, the different things. And How are you? Good to see you. Um, and so we would just love for you to be praying for us as we travel the, the world. And 
we want to add value to the kingdom. And uh, my lovely bride, Heather, is home with our daughter tonight. You understand what it's like to have kids go in different directions. And so our youngest daughter is 14, our son 16, and oldest daughter just turned 20. And um, I'm just thankful to be in the process with my lovely family. We're getting ready to go to the state high school finals this next week. But my son will be roping down there, and we will get to do church every day. We'll do church Sunday and then every day at lunch, or Monday through Thursday, we'll do church. We just got back from the uh, junior high finals where we got to do church down there on Sunday. Then I preached every day uh, throughout the week down there. And uh, right before that, I was in Indiana. They, uh, I went up there to the Extreme Bulls and spoke up there before the Extreme Bulls and then spoke at the rodeo the night before. And then I went to Colorado, and then I went to Gonzales, and then came back and went to Colorado the night before last and got in last night. And... Uh, and here we are. And, uh, and so, yeah, we are very thankful, very thankful. You know, we're getting to reach about 500 million people a week right now uh, around the world uh, through the different outreaches and stuff. And so I'm just very thankful for how good God is. And, you know, as we get into the word tonight, um, let's, let's don't just play church. We live in a day and age that it is a must that we know who we are in Christ Jesus. And we get over the religious games. That, that this isn't a game. Uh, you know, this is, it's real and God is real. And, you know, I haven't always uh, been, a, been a preacher. I was thinking of uh, the great I am. Uh, the last church, I've been in the ministry 24 years now, uh, pastored churches for uh, nine years almost, and helped start several different churches. Some were cowboy churches, some were non-denominational churches, but about seven different churches I helped uh, start and oversee. And uh, But one of the last churches I pastored, we was down in Midland, Texas, and uh, I was helping. They had what they call Rock the Desert, and they had all the big names come in, you know, Chris Tomlin, Audio Adrenaline. Uh, Jeremy, I mean, just the name goes on and on. And there's probably 20,000 people out there worshiping in this pasture. And if you've never been to Midland, Texas, it does not look like that out there. <laughs> I mean, it is dirt uh, and mesquite trees. And that's where I grew up is in Andrews, Texas, not too far from there. And, and so I just I signed up to serve. You know, a lot of different denominations come together and have all these bands and stuff come in. And, and so I just signed up to go to the prayer tent. And so I was just there, and, you know, it was 100 degrees in the middle of the summer and, and hot, and, and uh, I was in the prayer tent, and a lot of the denominations, well, I guess most of them, um, that was a part of this, putting all this together, um, you know, I was, somebody come in, I, I, I don't, I think it was something to do, they, they couldn't walk or something, they hurt their leg, and come in, and they asked, they said, well, Trey, would you pray for this person, and I, I said, you bet, and I prayed for this person, God completely healed their leg, and they couldn't walk, and then they could walk, and then it was so funny, then they came over with this long list of prayer, I mean, it was like this long, they said, <laughs> would you pray for them, and I said, you bet I would pray for them, and, and, uh, and so I, I, I left, I served my time there of praying and everything, and, and I went home, and I was getting ready for service the next Sunday morning, and uh, I just, man, I was so stirred in my spirit that I just had to go back up there, and had to go back up there, and so I wrestled with the Lord, I know you've probably never done that, but I was wrestling with the Lord, and uh, about two hours, and so I, I left the office and went back up there, and I just got back there, and as soon as I got back to the prayer tent, they said, oh, Trey, thank God that you're here. This guy's trying to commit suicide, and, and so can you talk to him, and, and so I talked to the guy, and I ended up casting the devil out of him, and of course, they didn't, they, they were like, okay, we're going to turn this way, and they're just looking this way, you know, and I just kind of stepped step back, because not everybody believes the same way and everything, and ended up uh, praying with this guy, and he got filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, of course, he gave his life to the Lord, and he got free and got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking. And by this time, it's 11 o'clock at night, and I'm just looking. There's 20,000 people, and I hadn't heard them do an altar call not one time. And so I go to the head guy, and I said, man, do y'all ever, you know, give people an opportunity to ask Jesus to come into their heart? And he looks at me. No. I said, would you do it? I said, you better believe it. I'll do it. He said, okay, you got about three minutes. Perfect. All God needs is an opportunity. <laughs> and I'll never forget, that was the song that they were singing right before they had me come up on the stage. 11 o'clock at night, three minutes, 
And there were hundreds of people except Jesus as our Lord and Savior that night. And that is just the God that we serve. Amen. And so as we get in to the word tonight, um, I, I want to encourage you when you hear me uh, refer to a scripture, please type it in your phone. Take If some of you still use pen and paper, please write it down. Uh, and and they're, they'll probably bring it up on the deal. And, and some of it we'll look at, some of it we won't look at. But it's important that we know what God's word says when it comes to our relationship with God. Amen. And so I want to encourage you as a church family to keep up the good work. Man, what a beautiful facility you have and what great things God is doing. And continue uh, to go into your spheres of influence and and bring people. Be a light shining in darkness. Uh, Like I mentioned, when I I gave my life to the Lord, I was 20 years old. I had quit college. and, And the reason I'm telling you this is just because this isn't a game to me. This is very real to me. And, and I take what I do very serious um, for the kingdom. And, uh, and so I, my, my parents did a great job. They cut me off. Uh, they said, Trey, we are not going to finance the decisions that you're making. And Because I'd quit college and I was living with a girl uh, out of wedlock. And um, just the whole drug environment, alcohol environment, all that type of stuff. And it, just in case you don't know, living with somebody out of wedlock, that's, that's wrong. Just, I know in today's society, you got to clarify yourself on some things. And so my parents said, we're not going to, we're not going to finance. Uh, yeah, it was great. At the time, I didn't think it was great. And, uh, and so I went home one weekend and uh, my parents said, you're always welcome here. We're just not going to finance what you're doing. And so I went home and I was leaving to go back to El Paso, Texas, where I was living at at the time. And when I was leaving, my dad come running out the back door and tears running down his face. And he says, Trey, the Lord showed me you're going to die if you don't get your life right. And I was like, yeah, right, Dad, you know, whatever. I thought he was just being a parent, you know what I mean, trying to pull one over on me. And, and so I went back to living the way that I was living. And about two weeks later, we were leaving the rodeo in Austin, Texas, and we were driving all night to another rodeo. And the guy I was roping with at the time was in the passenger seat. The girl I was living with at the time was in the back seat, and they were both asleep. And so I'm driving, and I wake up running down a four-lane highway, running 70 miles an hour in the median. And so when I, when I wake up, I try to pull the rig back onto the highway, and I realize I'm not going to make it because up ahead of us there's a big water, concrete water culvert, and it had the concrete slabs going up both sides. And so I pulled the truck back over in the middle, and I hit it perfectly with the truck, but the trailer hit the water culvert just right on. And just r- running 70 miles an hour, and it just ripped the trailer away from the truck, And as it did, we're spinning. If you've ever been in a wreck, how things are slow-mo, we're spinning in the truck. And as I'm spinning, I'm watching this trailer just go end over end over end over end. And when we come to a standstill over here, and I realize I was still alive, and I wasn't dead, and everybody else was still alive, I just took off running uh, towards the horse trailer. And when I get there, I mean, it's just a ball of tin. I had a living quarters in the front. Just a ball of tin, and the horses are just going nuts. We can't get any of the doors open by this time. Somebody called 911. And I find a a window that's open, and I crawl in the top of the trailer, and I'll never forget it. And I'm squatted down. There's blood all over the place, and I'm trying to calm the horses down while we're waiting for the jaws of life to come and cut the top of the trailer off. And I remember my dad. And I could see it just as plain as day, just tears running down his face and him saying, Trey, the Lord, show me you're going to die if you don't get your life right. And I knew that time that God had nothing to do with the wreck but he had everything to do with sparing my life and in that horse trailer I just called out to him because I I grew up and I'd seen what religion looked like and I didn't want anything to do with religion and I said God I want to know you and thank God my parents had taken me to church enough I knew I needed to call upon the name of Jesus and I just simply Asked Jesus to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. And, and so in that trailer that night, I, I made a decision that I want to know God. And the horses were okay. One of them couldn't compete anymore. Uh, several months in rehab and stuff like that. Uh, but they ended up being, uh, being okay. And so I went back to that same environment. That night I made a decision that I wanted to know God. And I made a decision that if I just saw it in his word, I was just going to do it. Say it, I'm going to do it. 
And I found the scripture, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And I needed everything. And so I was still in this environment, and I simply just started putting God first every day. Every day, every day. And about three months into the process, I... Um, and at a rodeo down in South Texas, and I wasn't good enough to rope in the, it was an open rodeo, I wasn't good enough to rope in the rodeo at that time, and I was sitting on the fence, and I was just watching the rodeo, and two of my heroes, they were world champions and everything, they were roping, and, and I don't know what they were thinking, it was just totally God all I know, and so they just ride up to me, and they said, hey Trey, uh, we have to be in Oklahoma City by 8 o'clock in the morning, would you drive us? Uh, well, they didn't even know my name was Trey, they just said, hey, you know, you kid, well, I don't even remember what they said. I said, yeah, no brainer. You know, I'll figure out how to get my stuff later. And I started telling him my story. And one of them, uh, Rich Skelton, he's eight-time world champion now. He wasn't saved at the time. But he said, why don't, why don't you just come move to Lano and come to work for me? And I was just getting started in my roping career. And I had a desire to be at the top of the game. And um, I said, yeah. So I moved to Lano. And just a few months after I moved to Lano, the FBI came in and busted the people I lived with with four and a half tons of drugs. If you're not very good at math, that is a lot of drugs. <laughs> Some of them have died in prison. Some of them are still in prison. But I began to put him first, and he promised everything else will be added unto me. And so through the years, I had no idea I would be called to the ministry and be doing what I'm doing now as I travel the world and teach leadership. I do a lot of leadership development uh, all around the world. And, um, and, and I look around sometimes when I'm in rooms of presidents of countries of different things, and they're asking me about leadership. And on the inside, I'm thinking, Lord, this is me. I know me. <laughs> I know where I've come from. And so I, I tell you that to encourage you to keep your hunger for God. Man, I looked around watching all of you worship God and go after God with all of our heart. I mean, you got to have a little bit of gumption to even be at church on a Thursday night. It is Thursday, right? Okay. Sometimes I got to think, okay, where am I and what day is it? Go with me to Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to start here, and we're just going to do our best to listen to the Lord, and you're expecting with me, right? We have, uh, we, we want His will to be done on earth just like it is in heaven, amen? Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19, and when Jesus came into the region of, this, of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Now pause there for a moment. Notice Jesus is asking them and us, Who do you say that Jesus is? Some say he's Jeremiah. Some say he's just Savior. Some say that he is a good man. Some say, but then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Because, see, he can be Savior to the pastors or healer or provider to somebody else. But who do you say that he is? Who do I say that Jesus is to me. Who is Jesus to you? Is he your mom and dad's Jesus? Is he your church's Jesus? Or is he your Jesus? Who do you say that he is? Is he healer to you? Is he provider to you? Is he protector to you? Is he deliverer to you? Is he all in all to you? Who do you say that I am? And it's very important that we have it settled regardless of who's in leadership or what is going on in the economy. Who do you say that he is? Whether diesel goes up to $20 a gallon, who do you say that he is? He is still provider. His word still works. The angels of God still work. They still minister for us. Who do you say that he is? And Peter says, we are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And he goes on to say, um, 
that blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. So notice, when it was revealed to him, Jesus said that you're blessed. Blessed means empowered to move forward. So when when something's revealed to us, in order for it to become where I'm experiencing it, something is revealed, I act upon it, the blessing is there. He says, blessed, when, it, when, when you learn, remember the, the half-brother of Jesus, who is James, who tells us those who receive the word of God, the engrafted word of God, the implanted word of God, and act upon it, they are blessed in their doings. They move forward in their doings. So I've got to ask myself, have I been coming to church for months, years, and nothing's changed? That lets me know if that is the case, then I am only hearing, but I'm not doing. Because he promised me that if I would hear his word and do his word, then I am going to move forward in life. I am going to grow. I am going to develop. I am going to become. He says, blessed are you. If Jesus stood in the front of you and myself, and he said, who is Jesus to you? And we begin to tell him, this is who you are to me. And then the empowerment is there for you and I to move forward in our finances, our marriage, our physical body, everything we're called and created to do now he doesn't stop there and then he says now I will give you he says okay my father's revealed this to you and on this rock this revelation who Jesus is I will build my church now church is not a religious word church is a governmental word and at this time Jesus is communicating in such a way that they understood what he was saying. The word church is uh, ecclesia, and I'm probably not saying it right, but you get the drift. And what that means, it was a governmental word like the emperor, like the king, would call people out individually, and he would bring them into a room, kind of like the senate, like the cabinet, and he would share his heart, he would share his mind, and then he would expect them to go out and to put into motion what he just shared with them. So Jesus is talking to you and I, and he's pointing to us, and he's saying, you're not just a churchgoer. This isn't a religious thing. It's not just the four walls in the church. He's saying, you are the called out ones. Now, are you willing to come near to hear what is on my heart and my mind with the intention that you're going to take it, and you're going to do it? You're going to take it, and you're going to do it. You're going to leave here with the expectation, I'm going to put into practice what is on the heart of my Father. He says, to these people... I will give the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Keys. Say keys. Keys Keys represent authority. They represent control. The person who has the keys uh, to the doors, unless you take the doors off, you know, they can... (laughs) I just had to throw that in there. I just think that is awesome. That's us, that's right. If you have keys to your house, we'll just use somebody else that has a door, okay? (laughs) Keys to the door, keys to the house, keys to the car. It gives you control. It gives you authority. And Jesus is saying, I give the keys not to the kingdom, but of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. You see the heaven-earth connection? Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Remember what Jesus taught the disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6 when the disciples come and they'd seen Jesus open the blind eyes. They'd seen Jesus multiply the bread and fish. They'd seen Jesus, you know, rub mud on people's eyes and stick his fingers in their ears and spit on somebody. And notice they didn't come to Jesus and say, would you teach me how to spit on somebody? I mean, that was cool right there. I mean, will you teach me? I mean, when you rub mud on that guy's eyes and he could see, I mean, would you, let's have the mud eye rubbing ministry of all times. No, what did they say? They said, will you teach us how to pray? Because they realized that what they saw out here was just an outflow of what happened here. And he says, okay, let's, let's start it like this. 
Our Father, which means source. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on just like it is. Are there tornadoes in heaven? Tornado on the north side of the throne room took out two angels. And <laughs> Is there sickness in heaven? Is the curse in heaven? And Jesus says, I want you to pray that my will is done on earth just like it is in heaven. Well, he said, I give you the keys, you, you the keys, not God the keys or not Jesus the keys. I give you the keys and whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loosed will be loosed. You see how he's, there's a connection between his will being done. He, there's a connection between the manifestation of the kingdom on earth just like it is in heaven. The, there's a, remember, remember in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 he says, I, I stand at the door and I huff and puff. And whether you open the door or not, I'm going to come in. That's not what he says. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. Now, and I'll go ahead and finish. He says, and if you'll open it, I will come in. Now, he's the creator of heaven and earth. Why doesn't he just blow the doors off the hinges? Why doesn't he just walk through the door? He could, but he doesn't. Because he says, him manifesting on earth has to do with us. Now, as I travel to all different types of churches, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Church of God, Presbyterian, I mean, this, the list goes on and on. You know one of the most famous sayings that we hear all across the board, especially when all hell breaks loose, is God is in control. That is one of the most damaging beliefs that is in the body of Christ. Because if God is in control, he is doing a very bad job. God is not in control of anything that steals, kills, and destroys. God is not employing the devil. How could Jesus look at a storm and command it, peace be still, and the storm was still? He wasn't questioning, okay, is the Father trying to teach me something I don't know if this is me, if this is the devil, if this is God. Mm, I'll just try it. Kind of like shooting a shotgun. Boom, boom, be still. I <laughs> hope it works. No, no, he knew. Anything that steals, kills, and destroys is not of the heavenly father. Now we're talking about him saying, I give you, you the keys. And what you forbid will be forbidden. What you bind will be bound on earth just like it is in heaven. Now, as you look through scriptures, and we could spend hours on this, there are, there are three different heavens. There's the heavens of our environment, our atmosphere. There are the heavens of the galaxies and the stars. And there's the third heaven where God, the throne room is. That, And he says, now what you do on earth is going to affect what happens in the heavens. So I'm going to ask you, and I ask myself, are there some things, let, so, so let's solidify it here, anything that steals, kills, and destroys, is it of God or is it of Satan? John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. Jesus is talking to us, and he says, Start praying this way that my will is done on earth just like it is in heaven. And right here he says to the called out ones, not to the Bible toters, not to the t-shirt wearers or the bumper sticker havers. He says to the called out ones that come near to here with the intention of hearing and I'm going to take it out and I'm going to do it. I'm going to live it. He says to them, I give them the keys. Now what you forbid, what you bind, what you loose is going to be what takes place upon the earth. I want to be involved, but remember, I'm standing at the door and knocking and I want to come in, but but you've got to let me come in. 
Have there been things that we have allowed that should not have been allowed? Now, this is something that's very important because a lot of times we wonder, we question how come this happened and how come that happened? I thought I was doing God's word. I thought I prayed. I thought, you know, I used the name of Jesus. You know, I, I stood on one foot. I, you know, rubbed my head. I... This is very important. We have a certain degree of authority in our sphere of influence. For example, I'm not going to come to your house and start naming your dog. I'm not going to come to your house and name your kids. I think his name should be John. Bill? Eh, John. Why? I don't have authority there. And I'll go ahead and let you know I I love you and everything, but you're not going to come to my house and name my dog. Why? Because you don't have authority there. Now, now the, the gentleman that was up here playing the guitar and talking about his gifts, and this is very important, and you can write it down and look at it in your own time. Isaiah 42, Isaiah 46, Isaiah 49. It talks about how Satan keeps people bound and locked up. And he never intends for one person to know the Father. He never intends to let one person come out of the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Please stay with me here. When God placed the gift in you and the grace on your life, He gave you the keys expecting you to go into your sphere of influence and those people that are bound, He expects you to take the key and unlock it and let them know they don't have to be bound anymore. Your gifts are very important. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, When you are operating in your gift and you're operating in your graces and, and I'm doing my part and you're doing your part and we're all doing our part, it says that we paint a picture of the manifold graces of God. We paint a picture of the goodness of God. So if I'm not developing my gift, if I'm not operating in my grace, if I'm not in my sphere of influence, even though I'm called there, I'm not operating in my authority and dominion to set the captives free. But when I'm developing and I understand I have keys and I have a degree of authority in this sphere of influence because I'm gifted, I'm graced, I'm called, then I can let them know it's unlocked. Now come out. Satan, you take your hands off their eyes. You take your hands off their ears. You get the plugs out of their ears. Their heart's receptive. Come into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You have a degree of dominion and authority in the sphere of influence you're called to. But for too long, we have sat back on our backside and we just say, well, God is in control. God is only in control when you give Him control. God is not in control of stealing, killing, and destroying. God is not in control of somebody that is a killing babies. God is not in control. God does not employ or put people. He's not somebody up there like a pulling puppet strings. Oh, this is really going to get them right here. I mean, let there, oh, 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 oh. So you're telling me if God is in control that he was in control of whether you ate Fruit Loops or Corn Flakes this morning? Well, yeah, brother. Whether you wore blue or whether you wore pink. Yeah, God, God. Whether you picked your nose or picked your bottom. Oh, yeah, I mean, I had an itch. That had to be God. No. God is in control when we give him control. So Jesus is saying, if, if, if he's telling us what we bind on earth is bound in heaven, what we loose on earth is loose in heaven, then, then there must be some authority and power and dominion in his body. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, he says, Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity to him. Who is not supposed to give the enemy any room? Okay. James chapter 4 verse 7. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Therefore submit to God. That's a choice. Because see, we can go against God all we want. Right? We can ignore God. We can not do what he says. We can... You know, do things our way. I mean, how does that work for us? I think we've all done that, right? Not so well. He says, but we can submit ourselves to God and who resists the devil? 
and he will stick around? No, he has to flee. But if I'm not resisting, he's not fleeing. Just like if I'm not using my keys, then he sticks around. Jesus says, you resist the devil. Nowhere in the New Testament can you find God doing anything about the devil. He tells you and I, you do something about the devil. You go cast out devils. You lay hands upon the sick. You take my name. In my name, you go. Remember Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, 18? He says, I was alive and then I was dead and, and now I'm alive forevermore and I've got the, key, the keys, the keys, the keys of death forevermore. Then Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, he says, Now all power and authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now I give it to you. Now you go into all the world and preach the gospel. Who, who has the keys? Who did he give the keys to? Okay, so let, let's, let's settle this. Did Jesus come to die for himself? Who did he come for? Okay. He didn't have any sins that he needed to die for, correct? Did Jesus need to get free from the devil? Okay, so who did he do that for? Jesus was given a name that was above every name. Did he need a name that was above every name? Or was he given a name? Or did he earn the name? Or did he get the name through inheritance for us? For us. Go ahead and say for us. So in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, and he gave Adam dominion and authority upon the earth. Then Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, and then the authority and dominion went to Satan. So God gave it to a man. Man lost his dominion and authority, so God had to send a man to get the dominion and authority back for man. And once he got the dominion and authority back, he said, All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Now I give it back to you because you're made in the image and likeness of God. Now you have a name. Now you have the power of the blood. Now you have angels. Now you go into your sphere of influence and take the keys because other people are counting on you to rise up and be everything you're called and created to be. It is not okay for us to be average. It is not okay for the Satan to run the church of Jesus Christ. It is not okay for us to sit on our backside and do nothing and put all the blame on God. Well, God is in control, and we're just sitting on our backside. No, 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 no. Say, not me. Not me. Ephesians chapter 1. Very powerful prayer that Paul prays, and I'm sure your leadership prays for you. Right? Leadership, you do pray for your church. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know, man, that seems like an odd question, but I'm telling you, I've seen some very interesting things. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, he says, for I, I'm reading now the Amplified Classic, and it says, For I always pray to the God of my Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him. Now notice, he's fixing to pray for three things right here. By having the eyes of their heart flooded with light. So, so Psalms 119 verse 105 says the entrance of God's word gives light. So Paul is praying that you and I see from our heart. That the eyes of their heart are flooded with light so that they can know and understand the hope. Number one, the hope to which they were called. Hope doesn't mean wish. Biblical definition of hope means a confident expectation. So I want you to see the intensity of Paul's prayer. He's not praying, now I'll lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I die before I wake. He's not playing, praying, you know, water the grass and bless the parakeet. No, no, there's some intensity. This is the church at Ephesus, and to you and I, he says, I'm praying that as they are in the presence of God and they're hearing about the knowledge of Jesus, that they begin to know. They don't guess. They don't wish. They begin to know the hope of what they're called to. They begin to see the expectation from the Father of what they're called. They've been called out of darkness and called into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That they begin to see themselves the way the Father sees them. That there's a confidence on the inside of them. That they understand they've been redeemed. They understand that they are the righteousness of God. They 
understand they have the name that are above every name. He says, I pray that they begin to see and this confidence rises on the inside of them that I am called for something greater than what I've been living in. The call, the word call does not mean uh, kind of like our cell phone, a little buzz, bzz, bzz. Call is the word summon, and it's an authoritative word that God is calling you and I with an expectation that we're going to get it, with an expectation that we're going to apply it, with an expectation that we're going to think on a different level, believe on a different level, live on a different level, all for the glory of God. God, Paul is not praying that we come together and we, come on, I pray that they have a good car wash. I pray, I pray that they sell a lot of popcorn. I pray, all that's fine and dandy, but there's something much greater than he's saying, I pray that they begin to see that they've been called out of darkness and into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set apart ones. So there's number two, the inheritance. So that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable, unlimited, surpassing greatness of his power for those who go to church. That's not what he said. The greatness of his power. And so some of you say, man, you give church a hard time. Why is that? Because I've seen religion kill more people than I've seen it help. Like I started this with, this isn't a game to me. He says, I'm praying that they begin to know and understand. There's a confident expectation that I'm made for such a time as this. And that I realize I have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. And this inheritance, it's not, it's so much more than just knowing we're going to spend eternity with God. That is the main thing to know that we are in right standing with God and Jesus is our Lord and Savior. But he's saying, I'm praying that they see the richness of this inheritance. The word rich means a full supply, amply supplied. He's praying, I pray that they see the bigness of what really happened when Jesus died on the cross and he went to hell and was raised from the dead. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father forevermore. I'm praying that they see this inheritance that Jesus didn't die for himself he died for them and he placed his spirit in them he gave them his name he created them for a purpose and destiny I pray that they realize this inheritance is so much greater and they experience the unlimited immeasurable surpassing greatness of his power the same power that God used when he raised Christ from the dead to those who believe see belief activates the power of God Belief comes from two Latin words. Be means to live or exist. And lithium means to live in accordance to. So when I believe God's word, I'm saying I'm living in accordance with God's word. I'm agreeing with God's word and I'm walking in accordance with God's word. When I believe, I'm in agreement with God. When I believe, and belief drives behavior. What's an indicator that I believe? My behavior is different. Belief drives behavior. Belief does what? Drives behavior. Something I ask myself all the time when I'm praying about something or I'm studying. If I truly believe that, what is my mindset going to be when I get up from here? What is my expectation going to be from my, when I get up from here? If I truly believe that God will watch over his word to perform it, how am I going to think? How am I going to talk? How am I going to praise? How am I going to worship? If I truly believe that he supplies all my needs, if I truly believe I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, if I truly believe that I'm created for such a time as this, if I truly believe that if God is for me, who can be against me? I'm not going to get up sucking my thumb and pulling my ear. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. Belief drives behavior. Belief does what? The reason I'm pausing because it's time for you and I to think about what we truly believe. And then, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, you don't have to go there, but it says it's important that I examine my own faith to make sure my faith is producing the fruit that it should produce. Because it's so easy for us to come to church and 
man, I, I wonder, well, they shouldn't be doing that, and they shouldn't be doing that, and oh my gosh, what are they doing over there? Oh my, oh, what, look, you see them? No, no, right here. Everybody do this. Put your fingers up. Where should we look? Don't point at me. Don't. Right here. Right here. Say, how am I doing? How am I doing? it? How am I doing? If I truly believe God's Word, how am I doing? Am I acting like I believe God's Word? Am I talking like I believe God's Word? Am I doing the natural like I believe God's Word? If, I'm, if I believe opportunities are coming, am I preparing like I believe God's Word? Something I ask myself all the time, does my discipline match my dream? Does my daily organization, my daily, what I do with my time every single day, is it setting me up to make the most when God brings the opportunity? Ephesians 5.16, it says, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity. Because every one of us have 86,400 seconds every single day, 1,440 minutes every single day, 24 hours every single day. And when I learn to use my time correctly, when opportunity comes, I'm not going to be wishing I could make the most of the opportunity. No, no. Day one, I use my time correctly. Day two, day three, day four. When I gave my life to the Lord, I gave you this. this I was a mess. And it was so overwhelming to me, all that I needed to change. Some things I was delivered from immediately. Other things, process, say it, process. <laughs> and so instead of trying to change everything, I just backed it up and I said, okay, I, I, I learned that, okay, if I can change my thinking, I can change my life. I found Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind, and I will prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So I began to think, okay, can I think at least one better thought today than I did yesterday? I can't change everything because that's overwhelming, but I can have one better thought, and I can change at least 1% today, and I'm going to get up tomorrow, and can I have a better thought today? Answer is yes, and I can change 1% today, and I get up tomorrow, and can I have a better thought? What's the answer? See, studies say we think between 60 and 100,000 thoughts a day. But the sad thing is most of the thoughts are the same thoughts we've always thought. That's why our life never changes. But if I can back it up and I can just think, okay, I can change 1% today and I can change 1% tomorrow and I can change 1% the next day and change 1% and 1% and 1%. When I get to the end of the year, I've got to introduce myself to a new me. That's what we should be doing for one another. Because I believe that, you know what, today you're seeing from your heart what you're called and created to do. And you're not going to allow what you see out here to talk you out of what you see in here. And so many times we let what we see out here talk us out of what we saw at one point in time in here. But when what we see in here gets so strong, we will not let what we see out here talk us out of what we see in here. That's why it is so important Paul is praying, I pray that they see, I pray that they know, I pray that they understand, I pray when they look at themselves, they see themselves the way that God sees them, that they are an overcomer, they have what it takes, they have the name that is above every name, they have the armor of God, of God, equipped, designed for them, and I believe that they're going to get it. I pray, I pray that they see, I pray that they know, I pray that they understand that there's so much more in us than what we've been walking in, church. Our inheritance. Our inheritance. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I just, I just want us to, to read this. Verse 14 through 17. Say it, our inheritance. Verse 14 through 17 in the Amplified. It says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For the Spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear. Say fear. But you have received the Spirit of adoption, the Spirit producing sonship in the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies together with our own Spirit assuring us... That we are children of God. Assuring us. 
First John 5 tells us that whenever we receive Jesus, we know that we have eternal life. We don't guess, we don't hope, we don't wish, we know. And it says right here that His Spirit is assuring us that we are children of God. And if we are His children, then we are His heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing His inheritance with Him. And Paul is praying, I pray that they see this inheritance. Inheritance, when you look at it in the Greek, it means a possessor. It means, it means somebody that is aggressive about what was left. Jesus died and was raised again and left us an inheritance. And then he left us his spirit to make sure we enjoyed his inheritance here and now. Notice he said this inheritance has to do with the Holy Spirit. So let's see this. His inheritance in Ephesians chapter 1. You can look at it in your own time. When we call upon the name of Jesus, it says that we are sealed with his spirit who is the forced taste of our inheritance. In other words, he says, I give them a taste of what they're going to experience for eternity. I give them a down payment of their inheritance that they're going to enjoy for eternity. But the down payment, the power of God, the spirit of God is in you and I. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we have an inheritance. We have his spirit and we have his name and we have the cleansing power of his blood and we have his righteousness we that is our inheritance and it says this spirit is assuring you the spirit is assuring you you are a child you are an heir you are a joint heir with Jesus so when Jesus was raised from the dead Ephesians 2 tells us we were raised from the dead when Jesus was quickened it tells us we were quickened when it says the head who is Jesus can we all agree and I'm just summarizing this can we agree Jesus is the head can we agree that Jesus has all power and authority now, if I come up to you and I introduce my head and I said, this is Trey, meet John, here's Bill, you would think, strange duck right there. No, my hand has the same name that my head has. My knee has the same right to be Trey, my name's Trey, by the way, as my head does. My fingers? See, my fingers are designed to be on my hand, right? Not my feet, not my head, my hands. Every small part of my body has just as much right to the name as my head. Now, Ephesians tells us Jesus is the far above all principality, power, might, ruler of the darkness of this world. So the head, who is Jesus, is in heaven, but his body, who is us, is upon the earth. But our inheritance, his inheritance, is our inheritance. Just like his name is our name. His name is our name. His name, the name of the head, the name of the head is the same name as the stomach, the same name as my heel, the same name as my calf, the same name as my belly button. All of it is the same name. The name has just as much power that is on the head is on the body. And he said that he exercises his power through the body who is the church. You're saying, what is the point of this message? That there's more for you and I to walk in than what we've been walking in. I've got to ask, have I been binding the things that need to be bound in the areas that I'm called to? Remember, you're gifted, you're wired, you're designed. You've got the keys to go into a certain territory. And what you bind is bound. What you loose is loose. Because you have dominion and authority in that territory. I don't have dominion and authority in that territory. You do. So he says, you go. Now I can connect my faith with yours. But there's more for us to live in than what we've been walking in. Part of our inheritance is an inheritance that is not of fear, but it is of faith. Now, I'm getting ready to be done here. But, but let's go back to 2 Timothy. Now, notice this spirit. He, he delivers us um, from the bondage of fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5-7. through 7. Part of our inheritance is to use the name that is above every name. Say, that's my inheritance. 
So let's get real with ourselves. Have we been using that name? I'm not talking just some cute little prayer, you know, bless my biscuit in Jesus' name. No, we need to do that. But am I tapping in? To I remember I was at a rope in, in New Mexico, and I'm always listening. Remember, where you're gifted and you're graced, you have dominion and a power and authority there. But it's still, it always comes down to learning to listen. Say, learning to listen. And so I rope this steer, and I ride out the back of the arena, and this Indian guy, he's, he, I mean, you could just smell the alcohol and stuff on him, and he's running the gate and everything, and this steer runs and hits the gate and just snaps his arm. I mean, you could see the bone right on top of the other bone in his arm. And on the inside, I'm asking, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? Because there's times he don't say anything. I mean, it isn't that he's not talking. I'm sure it's me just learning how to listen better. This time he says, I want, you to, I want you to pray for his arm. So I get off my horse and I grab this guy's arm. And I said, I command you bones to come back into alignment in the name of Jesus. And you could just see it and I could feel it underneath my hand. That bone just come right back into alignment. Our inheritance is using the name. There's an, another time I was at this rope and this lady, I mean, she was loud. And she had been on the sauce for a long time and and. Whop! They're standing in a bunch of horses and everything. This horse kicks her right here and just snaps her femur. And she's just laying down. I mean, she is creating some cuss word. You know. Which I don't blame her at the time, you know. I, we're all a work in progress, right? Once again, I'm asking, Lord, what do, you, what do you want me to do? And he says, I want you to lay hands. Of course, everybody's gathered around and everything. He says, I want you to, I want you to lay hands upon her. And so I just squat down to her and I grab her by her head like this because she's laid down. I grab her head and says, ma'am. God wants you to know that he loves you. And I just begin to command that leg to come back into alignment in the name of Jesus. I didn't tell her my name. I didn't tell her anything. And you could just see that, that bone just lined back up. They just picked her up, and I just walked out and left. And I was like, Lord, what, what was that about? <laughs> he said, I just wanted her to know I love her. So I've got to ask myself, am I using, and I could sit up here for hours and tell you story after story. Remember, this isn't a game. There is more in us than what we've been walking in. And Paul is praying for you and I. He prayed that prayer then and the prayer, the power of that prayer is still that, that we can see and we know and understand. Part of our inheritance is the name. You, you, you live up here where you need to know the name that is above every name. I was doing a, a roping clinic at NRS in Decatur, and we're watching, you know, we'd video different runs and everything. We're sitting in there, and we're watching, and we're going on this, and somebody comes in the door, and they are just full of fear. Oh, my gosh, you got to hurry. Get your rigs. Pull it in the truck. Tornado's coming. And you could look out, and it was just pitch black, and you could see the tornado coming this way. And, and I just said, whoa. I said, it is not coming here as long as I'm here. And I just begin to speak to that thing, and I command it to dissipate and lift and go around. And I just begin to speak to it, and within three minutes, you could just watch it. Just went right around us. And this black guy's in the school and everything. He looks at me. He goes, boy, you got the juice. <laughs> I said, yes, and his name is Jesus, and you can have the same juice. See, we're talking about how do I get God to show up. Remember, in, in the areas you're gifted and graced in. You have dominion and authority, and I've got to ask myself, am I using the keys because what I bind on earth is bound, and what I loose on earth is loosed. I'm, I'm working. Am I working in agreement with God in the area of my finances, my physical body, my relationships? Are, are you with me? And it says this spirit in us, when we look in here, is assuring us, that's my father. Not a, not a spirit of fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, the New King James Version. Paul is writing to Timothy, and at this time, uh, Timothy had got his eyes off of his purpose, off of what he was called to do. I mean, you, you think about it. At this time, they were hanging Christians up on a pole and burning them alive all the way down the streets, and that, were, that was the light poles. And Timothy knew that the next knock could be the Roman soldiers coming to get him. And so Paul writes to Timothy in this stint. He says, I call to remembrance the genuine, say genuine, 
faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded is in you also. He was saying, Timothy, I need you to go back to the times. This isn't just some cute prayer. I need you to go back. And remember when you were with your grandmother and with your mom and when they prayed, things happened. You remember, Timothy, the same God that answered their prayers. Timothy, I need you to go back and I need you to recall that you have the same faith that they have. See, when we come into the kingdom, we're all given the same measure of faith. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. The word measure is the Greek word matron, and it means the same measure. Like if we went to your house and we had a pie and we cut up each piece and we all had the same amount, but then it's up to us what we do with the faith that is given to us. And Paul is telling Timothy, and I'm encouraging you tonight, I want you to recall the hunger and thirst and passion that you one time had for God. And he goes on, he says, Timothy... I'm persuaded it lives in you, and I want to remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. See, there's times that our flesh doesn't feel like coming to church. I know you're going to look at me real holy here, but as a preacher, there are times I don't want to come to church in my flesh. (laughs) You should see some of the looks that we get up here. Really? Really? You ever seen the the show Planes, Trains, and Automobiles? You know, that's what I feel like sometimes. I mean, I've preached 16 times in the past 14 days, and I've flown, and I've drove, and I've flown, and I've drove, and there's times my flesh just wants to just... But Paul's telling Timothy, I need you to stir up while you're here. I need you to stir up why you're gifted the way you're gifted, why you're wired the way you're wired, why you're designed the way you're designed. I need you to stir it up on the inside of you. Look at your neighbor and say, stir it up. He says, I need you to stir up the gift as is in you through the laying on of our hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The spirit of fear. The spirit of fear. Have have you realized how dominant the spirit of fear is out in the world? And it says, God did not give me a spirit of fear. Fear has no right in the family of God. Say it, no fear here. Remember, from the young kids, as soon as the kids started riding horses and everything, you know, a horse would start to swell up or kind of ball up until you could see them, their eyes get big, and they just kind of cry. I say, oh, I get it coming out of your mouth. No fear here. No, no, no fear here. No fear here. You know, they're thinking, yeah, right, buddy, I'm messing in my drawers. <laughs> you know, no fear here. <laughs> but as soon as they started saying no fear here, guess what? They begin to relax, and that spirit of fear had no, no power and authority in their life. Say it, no fear here. Psalms 23, verses 4 and 5. Remember the psalmist David, he says that, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Say it, no fear here. I don't care what the, what the news says, no fear here. I don't care what the doctor's report is, no fear here. So if there's a spirit of fear, the opposite of that is a spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, you can write these down and You can look at it in your own time. And it says, and since we have the same spirit of faith. Say it, spirit of faith. According to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore we speak. See, there's a spirit of fear and the spirit of faith. We live by faith or we live influenced by fear. And who chooses that? We do. Remember, what you allow will be allowed. What you forbid will be forbidden. So if I am full of fear, it is not God's fault. It is my responsibility. The spirit of fear, what does the spirit of faith sound like and look like? The spirit of faith that says, believes God's word and it declares God's word. So when you feel the fear, you feel the symptoms of fear, you get the report from the doctor, you get, you hear on CNN constant negative news that stock market's going haywire. You feel the fear, what does the spirit of faith do? It believes God's word and it declares God's word. The spirit of faith does not suck its thumb and pull its ear and, oh, my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do, Margaret? I don't know. Oh, my God. No, the spirit of faith opens its mouth 
And even while you feel fear, and even though it's trying to consume you, you believe God's Word and you declare God's Word. You believe God's Word. Remember, my belief drives my behavior. So you begin to believe God's Word and speak God's Word and believe God's Word and speak God's Word and believe God's Word and speak God's Word. And And the same spirit of faith that was on Moses and Noah and Abraham and Jesus and Peter and John is the same spirit of faith that is in and on you when you believe God's word and you declare God's word. God always has to have our words to work with to get his will done on earth as it is in heaven. We're we're going into Australia several years ago, my wife and I and my wife, she had you know, has a prison sentence. I mean, you'd see her and you'd never think that she's this beautiful and this. But, I mean, she's a warrior for the kingdom. And so they didn't, even though they, Australia was built off of prisoners, they don't let prisoners come into Australia. And so we're already in Australia and we're there at Customs. And the way we have did everything that we knew to do and everything, we're going over there to preach and doing all this type of stuff. And they come, they say, y'all come with us. And we come over to the side and they say, ma'am, we're, we're, not, we're not letting you in. And, of course, we're supposed to be there for 12 days, preaching day and night for 12 days. And then, so I just started, remember what the spirit of faith does? What does it do? Believes God's word, declares God's word. Believe God's word. So I began to ask, I said, Lord, what, what words do you want me to declare? What can you use And I begin to declare the same way you were with Moses when he parted the Red Sea is the same God that is with me. The same God, and I just started going all through these Bible stories. The same God that was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the same God that is within me. And I just declare that we have the favor of God that surrounds us like a shield. And somehow, some way, Father, I just ask that things open up for us. And they come out and they said, we never do this. But how long did you say you were here? I said, 12 days. They said, okay, you be out of the country in 12 days. I said, thank you, bye-bye, see you later. Mm. All for the glory of God. <laughs> but, but see, what if, what if I would have melted down? Oh, my God, oh my, this must be God teaching us something. It must be God's will. No, no, it was not God's will. You know what was God's will? That we went over there, and I can't even tell you how many people were saved and set free and delivered. That was God's will. See, we got to take our keys and go into the sphere of influence that we're called to and set the captives free. Part of our inheritance is the spirit of faith, not the spirit of fear. Psalms 37 verse 4 says, The Lord heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Not some of my fears, all of my fears. And we can come to church and we can be real religious and, Oh, how you doing? Oh, blessed and highly favored. And on the inside, our stomach is just in knots. How are you doing? Oh, blessed. I mean, God is so good. Uh-huh. And we hadn't slept in three days because we're worried and consumed with fear and anxiety and how's this going to happen? How's that going to happen? Fear gives Satan a right to operate like faith gives God a right to operate. Remember, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. What you allow on earth is allowed in heaven. What you loose on the earth is... You you with me? Part of our inheritance is not fear, but faith. And and one of the keys to operating in the power of God is, is being real with yourself. I mean, I could sit up here and tell you stories of just God raising horses from the dead and steers from the dead and babies from the dead. But I can also tell you stories when I tried to kid myself and I tried to pray and act bold and act religious and it didn't happen. And I knew the whole time I was praying and doing it, there was no, I was nowhere near at a place in my faith and my word level to pray like that. But hallelujah, bless you, Jesus. I was saying all the right things and nothing happened. Thank God we're learning, right? We're learning. Say, he's learning. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. I am learning. But, but we can. Every day we can get better. Every day we can hear more. And when that fear tries to creep in, what does the spirit of faith do? Believes God's word and declares God's word. First John chapter 4, and we're getting ready to be done. You're thinking, bless the Lord, about time. 
No, no, that's not you. Say, not, I, say I, I love the word. 1 John 4, verse 16 through 18. And we have known and believed. And if you're wanting other scriptures on what to do with fear, write down John 14, verse 1, verse 27. And Jesus tells you and I, don't let your heart be troubled. But believe. Say it, believe. He says, my peace I leave with you. His peace is a peace that no drug can give you. No alcohol, no, nothing. It's, it's his peace. He says, but you don't let your heart be troubled. Whose responsibility is it? Okay. First John chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. Notice it doesn't just say, I've heard about the love. It says, no, I, I've known and believed. Believe. Remember, belief drives what? Behavior. If I truly believe that God loves me, I'm going to pray different. He's going to answer my prayers not because I'm so good, but because He's so good. When I believe, God is going to provide all of my needs. Why? Because He loves me. God is going to help me walk free from this addiction. Why? Because He loves me. God is going to get me to where I'm supposed to be because He loves me. God is going to restore and rebuild my life. Why? Because he loves me. God's going to show up every single time for me because he loves me. God is going to help me. When I fall down, he's going to help me get back up. Why? Because he loves me. Because he loves me. And he says, I've known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Boldness. In the day of judgment, boldness is the absence of fear. He says, and because we know the love of God, we're going to be bold in the day of judgment. What is this saying? That when Jesus comes back and people don't, that don't know Jesus are running and screaming and they're trying to cover themselves with rocks and they're crying out with fear, the spirit in you is going to be declaring that's my daddy. That's my father. Everybody else is going, ah, oh, running. And it says we're going to be as bold as a lion because we are a certain. Because of the love of God, I'm forgiven. Because of the love of God, I'm in right standing with God. He says we will have boldness in the day of judgment. So if I can have boldness in the day of judgment, I should have boldness in today. Boldness is the absence of fear and perfected love cast out fear. The word cast means to throw it out. It means to get rid of it. Because God loves me, I'm going to approach my, my job. I'm going to get up in the morning. Because he loves me, I'm going to have boldness then. I'm going to have boldness right now. I'm going to take my gift, and I'm going to be bold. I'm going to take my grace, and I'm going to be bold. And I'm going to take the key, and I'm going to let the devil know you no longer control the area that I'm called to. I walk in dominion and authority in Christ Jesus. I'm I'm going to use the name that is above every name. I'm going to use the power of the blood. I'm going to use my armor. And I'm going to charge hell with a water pistol. Why? Because you have boldness because you know God loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Regardless of my past, regardless of the addiction, regardless why well, I did this, and I cussed this guy out, and I beat this guy up, and I did this, and I did that. No, no, because he loves me. The old is gone. The new has come. In the day of judgment, he says, you're going to be bold. But because you know the love of God, you're bold now. He says, I want you to pray with boldness because he loves you. I want you to give with boldness because he loves you. I want you to worship with boldness. Why? Ah, oh, because he loves us. He loves us. So... Have I been allowing some things that I should not be allowing? And we could all do this. This is good for us. Do this. But I'm making a decision today. God, help me. Father, I'm praying that he reveals to us that we begin to see from in here what our inheritance is, that we have his spirit, we have his name, we have the power of his blood. We have his word. We have angels. 
there's so much more in our inheritance. And we're going to get up in the morning. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit that he recalls this to our remembrance. Use your keys today. Remember what you bind. Now, I'm going to tell you this. It isn't a one-time deal. The devil is a persistent cuss. I don't even know where that saying come from, but you, you get what I'm saying, right? Grandma, that's right, Aunt Boo Boo and Uncle Ding Dong, they said that too. <laughs> but you spend time and you, you renew your mind to the truth and you take your keys and you, you bind Satan off of your sphere of influence and off your family and off your resources and off your gifts and off your calling and you remind him. 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose, the Son of God manifests to destroy the works of Satan. Devil, you are defeated. You are brought to nothing. You have to take your hands. I will go everywhere I'm called to go, do everything I'm created to do, all for the glory of God. I've got my keys. I'm packing. <laughs> I'm packing. Say it, he loves me. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? Oh, Father, he loves us. He loves every single one of us, and with heads bowed and eyes closed, I, I, I want you to go inward. Remember that assurance that we talked about? Remember that knowing that we talked about? Can every person at the sound of my voice, when you go in your heart, and if you were to stand before the Father today, if today was the day that you were to, to transition from here to there, when you look into your heart, can you recall the moment? Can you recall the time when you yourself called upon the name of Jesus? Were you settled where you're going to spend eternity? Can you recall it? Not, not what your mom and dad did or not because you went to church. No, you knew that that was the time. That was the moment that I believed in my heart and I declared with my mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord. And you know. You know that you know that you know that you'll spend eternity with God. But if you look into your heart and you don't have that knowing, you can't recall the moment that you've done that, would you make tonight that moment? Would you make right now that time that you make a decision to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and declare with your mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord. Would you make right now the moment to settle where you're going to spend eternity? You say, how? How can I do that? It's very simple. The Bible says when we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and declare with our mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord. He says, at that time, you receive eternal life. Now, now you mean it. You don't just do it so you don't go to hell you do it because you want a relationship with God. You, you do it because you want to know the same God that showed up for Abraham and Moses and Noah. And so this is what I'd like us to do. With heads bowed, eyes closed. I would like us to pray a very simple prayer together out loud. And the reason I have all of us pray it together out loud is I want the people that are doing this for the very first time, I want them to be confident in the prayer that they're praying. Another reason I do it out loud is because I want you familiar with the heartbeat of this prayer. So when you have the opportunity to pray with your friends and your family, you can pray with them. But if you're wanting to settle where you're going to spend eternity as we pray this prayer, you do it believing it in your heart and declaring it with your mouth like your eternal destiny depends upon it because it does. And you can be certain that right where you're sitting or standing, you receive eternal life. And you can know that you'll spend eternity with God. Can we pray this prayer together? Can we say, Father God? Father God. Say it like you mean it. Father God, Father God. Today is the day. That I believe in my heart. That God raised Jesus. From the dead. To give me life. And right now. I accept that life. And I ask you Jesus. To come into my heart. To be my Lord. To be my Savior. And according to God's word. I receive my forgiveness. I have eternal life. I can be certain. That I'll spend eternity. With Almighty God. Now with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you said that prayer for the very first time in your life. And you meant it. You meant it. On the count of three, I want you just to slip your hand up in the air and hold it there for a moment, saying, yes, I said it, I prayed it, and I meant it. One, 
two, three. Would you just slip your hand up? God, hold it up just for a moment. God sees this hand and this one and these two right here and this one here and that one there and that one back there and this one here and that one there and those two there. These two over here on the end. Is there anybody else that said, yes, I prayed it and I meant it for the very first time? Now, you, you can put your hands down. Now, look up here at me. The Bible says angels in heaven are worshiping because of the decisions that were just made all for the glory of God. That is the greatest decision that you'll ever make in your life, ever. If, if you don't have a home church, you're here just visiting, I, I want to encourage you, get plugged in here. If you don't have a home church, message us. Go to all of our social media stuff, Trey Johnson Ministries, and you can leave us a message. We will do our best to help you find a Bible teaching church in the area that you live in. But it is important now. Remember, remember 1% of the day? It's important that we get connected and we begin to learn and grow. That's why we do the books and the CDs and flash drives and YouTube channels. Why? Because we all are a work in progress. Years ago, I asked the Lord, Lord, what is success? And I first gave my life to the Lord. He says, Trey, true success is a person being in the process of knowing him and being the best us we can be. Because the more aware we become of him, the more we become aware of what we've been put on this earth to do. So I want to encourage you, get that stuff back there. Rob, be there. Get connected with the pastors and stuff. Um, I'm fixing to hand this back over to you, Pastor. But, but these are specific things. Whenever we dismiss, I'm going to be up here. I'd love to pray with you, pray for you. I know that I went uh, for a while, but it's all good. Say it's all good. it's all good. Specifically, if you've been having the anointing of God is just all over this area right here. When I say, when I called these out, and I know you're used to this, this is a word of knowledge and knowing, you've been having issues in your teeth. I'm telling you, the presence of God is here to deal with that thing. You've had cysts. I don't know what area the cyst is. <laughs> Sometimes when you pray for something, this one lady come up one time, and she was a very large lady, and she come up, I got this thing right here in my... I said, whoa. I know it says lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I said, but I'm going to speak the word only. <laughs> you have, have, have been dealing with cysts or something like that uh, for a time now. The presence of God is here to take care of that. Also, there's uh, whoever that is that you've been having, you've had issues in the back of your throat, and it's not sinuses, it's not, it's been an issue. Um, I, I want to lay my hands upon you. I want to pray for you. I see miracles every week of my life around the world. Our God is the same God. And if you need prayer for anything else, I mean, let's honor what God is doing up here. I know the prayer team and stuff will be up here. We'd love to pray with you, pray for you. Uh, I'm going to be down here. But, Pastor, go ahead and come on up, and I'm going to hand it back over. Did you get something out of the Word today? Yeah. Praise God. I just give God all the honor, all the glory. Amen, amen. Give Brother Trey another big round of applause. Man, if y'all want to come back up and y'all want to play, prayer warriors, uh, pastors, elders, if you feel like led to pray, come down front. Um, now that you guys have been here long enough, if you come to this church, you know what we're here for, um, what we open up the altar for. Like I said, if, if Trey, if he, he calls you out of one of those, go see him. If you got something else going on, you want to see one of us, come down front. But like you said, there are things in each one of our lives that we're dealing with. Nobody in this building today is immune to making mistakes, to having issues in their life. And if we would all step forward and be brave enough to come down front and get prayer for those things, can you imagine the chains that would drop tonight? Can you imagine the, the lives that would be set free and the things that we could accomplish in his name? Amen? Amen. Well, if y'all would stand, we're going to pray. Where the Lord is, there's freedom. So if you need to go, go. So, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we praise your name. And, and as the band starts to play and sing and worship to you, may you touch the hearts and give a new boldness into each one of us, Lord. As we leave here tonight, Lord, may we remember the things that were spoken to us and over us today. Lord, bring back tomorrow and the days to come to our remembrance 
the lessons that were learned tonight. Because when we learn it and we apply it into our lives, that is when we grow. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Y'all come down front for prayer.